You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. And I'm your host, Jim Friend. Well, welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We unexpectedly had to take last week off because life and projects, well, they just got a little crazy. I'm sure you can identify with that. It's great to be back with you. I love this show. I love doing this show, and I feel so fortunate to get to meet so many amazing disciples of Christ who are truly advancing our church. So I'm making my way through a New Testament course for my diaconate training, and we had to read a book last week on the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Unbeknownst to me, there were 65 of them, so there was a lot of content to absorb in a very short period of time. But there was one that really filled me with hope, that really inspired me, and I want to share that with you, because it's the story of Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel. Hannah had prayed to God for a child, and up until that point in her story, it was thought that she might be barren. And so Hannah prayed and promised that if God only gave her a son, that she would in turn give that child's life back to God for his greater service. After much prayer at the tabernacle and making a bit of a spectacle of herself, which caused the high priest to think that she was drunk, God gave her a son whose name was Samuel. But it was Hannah's incredible, outspoken faith in God that created the foundation for Samuel to come into the world and grow up to be one of the most important figures in the history of the Old Testament. Samuel played a key role in transitioning from the time of the judges to the time of the kings. And in God's perfect plan, Samuel would be the one to transfer his political authority to the king, which paved the way for the coming of King David, who, in turn, created the line that led to the coming of Christ. But what was so significant for me in this story is that it all began with the pious faith that Hannah held in her heart for the Lord to grant her a son. How could she possibly know the impact that her faith would have, not only in granting her a son, but the impact that that son would have on the world? So for us, As we think about the ordinary decisions we make every day, whether or not your Lenten sacrifice matters or the prayers that you might say to God matter, I want you to think about the incredible faith of Hannah and how her son helped prepare the way for the coming of Christ. For us, we have a connection to that same faith that Hannah had in the ordinary prayers that we offer to God. May we also pave the way for the coming of Christ just as Hannah did. Now, let's get to work. Our guest today is Mark Konzemius, the president of the Catholic Community Foundation for Eastern South Dakota. Mark has been the president of the foundation for over 26 years. He has a long history of leadership, relationship development, fundraising, and public speaking, just to name a few of his gifts. I think what impressed me the most about Mark during this interview was his deep and personal faith in Christ, which just permeates his whole being. Just an incredible man, an incredible story, too, of faith and devotion to his work. I really enjoyed getting to know Mark, and I think you will, too. So, without further ado, here's our conversation. Well, Mark, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you here on Advancing Our Church. Uh, It's a real privilege and pleasure. Thank you. So, Mark, uh, we were talking right before we started here. We both thought maybe it'd be a good time to start with a prayer. So, I mean, there's a lot going on in our world. And, um, you know, perhaps for our listeners, uh, we could just take a, a moment and uh, and just kind of ask for God's blessings on Mark, on his ministry, on our discussion today. And uh, for all those who are suffering in, in our country uh, through this virus, uh, through some of the racial anger and hatred that we've seen in the news, uh, those who need our assistance, we'll pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace. The, the Lord, Lord is, is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst among women, women. And, and blessed, blessed is, the is the fruit of thy, of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, pray for, for us, us sinners, sinners, now and, and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Spirit, amen. So, Mark, are you a, a native of South Dakota? Uh, actually, I am originally from Minnesota, and uh, ah. yeah, graduated from actually North Dakota State. 
Okay. And then ended up spending uh, 13 years with a nonprofit called Up With People. And that okay. Was, uh, so it was five years, in a sense, with no home address. Just <laughs> wonderful opportunity to live with host families and uh, yeah. traveled in 35 countries, uh, all 50 states during those 13 wow. years. And then it was based in Tucson. So I lived there for seven years. Um, oh. That's where we had our first two children and then moved to Denver for two years. We relocated the headquarters. And then I got a call from a guy one day who convinced me it wasn't a buddy playing a joke on me that I actually was the new bishop in South Dakota. And he said, hey, <laughs> uh, I, need, uh, I, I need to you know, uh, build up the foundational resources of our diocese. And mm -hmm. I got your name from somebody. We'd never met each other. <laughs> and I didn't know any bishops. So uh, that's how I ended up in South Dakota. You got the call directly from the big guy. That's amazing. Uh, on a Saturday afternoon, um, <laughs> on Memorial Day weekend, I remember it well. It was uh, now Archbishop Carlson, who uh, okay. was the newly retired Archbishop Emeritus of uh, St. Louis. At that's the time was that's amazing. Bishop here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> There's a man of faith, man. Uh, I tell you. Know, yeah, well, and you. Up. And you literally got the call. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's no uh, <laughs> no disputing that. Yeah, yeah the well, biggest you... miracle is my wife's from New Hampshire, and and uh, we oh. had toured, as I mentioned, all fifty states, and we spent four weeks touring South Dakota, and that means just about every city, right? Because there's not we have a lot of space and not very many people. Yeah, uh, but um, she said yes, man. She's she's amazing, and uh, this has been her home now for. 26 years and we cannot think of a better place to have raised our children mm -hmm. and uh, to be living here right now and uh, praise God being able to work for his church here. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, um, my wife and I live in, in Allentown and I had never even been to Allentown 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And I, I never, never had any designs on Allentown, but, you know, I got a similar call about, you know, applying for this, that position years ago that brought us to this area. And, you know, we sight on not well, we, we did a little exploring when we came up, but, um, you know, it was a similar experience. You know, we weren't from here. We made a home here and uh, now we're, we're just very happy. We've been here 13 years. So, and you live yeah. in a gorgeous area. I was, uh, I was looking a little bit at some pictures of places like Falls Park and uh, the uh, Sculpture Walk and the Ark of yeah. Dreams Monument. Oh my and... gosh, I'm impressed, Jim. They're right <laughs> outside my window. Is it I really? Could, yeah. Uh, yeah, I should probably just turn my laptop camera and show it to you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's impressive. Did you happen to see a photo of our Cathedral of St. Joseph? I did. I saw the interior and I, I saw an outside picture as well. What a beautiful, beautiful space you have there. Yeah, yeah, it was named by Architectural Digest or one of those magazines as the most prominent architectural building in the state. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so God bless the immigrants, right? Ma many, right. for us, Irish Catholic immigrants who worked the meatpacking plant 120 years ago and they wanted to build something really special in Thanksgiving to God and um, knew that they'd never complete it. Like mm -hmm. many of the cathed great cathedrals of the world, and we have one right here. It's, yeah. it's really extraordinary and very beautiful and continues really to is. be a, a civic and sacred landmark. Yeah. I saw that it has quite a history. I was reading a little bit of the history of uh, how, you know, um, the, the um, how it was constructed and, you know, the, the land rights with, uh, uh, with the native Americans that were there at the time and uh, some of the first settlers. It's really, uh, it's really an impressive story and an impressive structure. Mm -hmm. I've been, yeah. been there about 100 years now, roughly. Uh, I saw. Yeah, it had celebrated its 100th anniversary a year ago. And um, you yeah. see the yellow heart hat up there. That's, uh, yeah. that's from our cathedral restoration that okay. the Catholic Community Foundation is privileged to be a part of. And nice. got our little cathedral logo and beacon of oh, hope. Cool. That's what, because nice. it is up on a hill and it's a, it is a landmark. It really is, as one of our donors called it, uh, and bishops, uh, an evangelist in stone. Mm. Um, you know, less and less people are coming inside the doors of the church, but because it's this incredible, uh, beautiful architecture, people are drawn to it. From Falls Park, you mentioned the mm -hmm. namesake of our city of Sioux Falls. You can see it up on the hill, the spires. It's, and uh, it really does raise your eyes to God. And it, it, there's something about it that calls you in. And we pray humbly that and hope that God would use 
that art and architecture is a way to teach, right? And mm -hmm. to draw people in closer. And we have some wonderful stories of transformation of how people have actually mm -hmm. been drawn back to the church. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many ways and God uses so many different ways to call us and art and architecture is one of them. And we're yeah. blessed to have that here. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, your bishop, Bishop DeGrood, he's been there a little over a year now, I see. And um, yeah. I was reading a little bit about his story. He got apparently got sick when he first got there, when he first arrived, and <laughs> right before yeah. COVID. And now he's had COVID yeah. during his first year as the, as the bishop. Well, quite a ride for him, huh? Can you imagine? Um, no. <laughs> first of all, getting a call from, you know, uh, he tells the story. I'll, I'll try to do it quickly, Jim, but no, he, uh, he, uses, he has a cell phone right here in his pocket, right? And he goes, I'm in a yeah. meeting and you know, I hit the, it's a 203 number. I don't recognize it. It's probably somebody telling me my car <laughs> warranty is up. So, he, you know, and then all of a sudden it rings again. It's the same thing. And it's Washington, D.C. It's like, I don't know anybody there. And that, well, <laughs> third time, you know, I better go. And uh, it's the Nuncio. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing story. And um, one of his great charisms as we know from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, right? We all have many gifts. It's one, mm -hmm. we're all one body with many parts. And hit, mm -hmm. one of his great charisms really is uh, drawn to um, a life of contemplation mm -hmm. at, at, in the diocesan priesthood and now as a bishop, mm -hmm. where he really uh, truly honors time of silence, of really listening to God speaking. And he, God speaks clearly to him in many amazing ways. Some very challenging ways, of course. Sure. Um, but he's brought that gift and that joy and the confidence that comes from mm -hmm. uh, really hearing God's voice and having that confidence and knowing it. Um, and you need it during the time of uncertainty to have the certainty that comes from faith that really truly knows that Jesus is in the boat with us during the storm. Yes. And, and he he is with us. And to have that confidence has been a great gift to us. He. He had no idea until we told him later, but he was the first bishop in the country who just really felt strongly this, this, the, 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 um, the call, if you will, to come back to church. If you are healthy, uh, if you can do it safely, and we, be we believed we could do it safely from a church context, but if, and if you were in a situation where you weren't caring for somebody, right, who was vulnerable, come back and receive the sacraments. Yeah. And later to find out he was the first to do it. And certainly it's been a challenge, but he's had a real conviction in his heart. And I believe he's done it in a very loving way. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, God bless our bishops, you know, any leader um, and, and all of us are leaders in some capacity. Right. This has been a difficult year to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's uh, we've had to think and rethink and, and again, try to make decisions in the context of uncertainty. And it's hard to do that. I'm, I've always been grateful, Jim, these last 20, uh, 26 years now, but especially this year to be leading an organization in a faith context that, that, that I'm a faith based organization. I can't yeah. imagine how in the world could you make decisions this past year without without knowing God's there with you. Uh, and having that confidence that comes from that. So our bishop's been a wonderful gift to us. I happen the backstory on is getting sick. Um, you know, like most bishops, once you get ordained, you want to go out and meet the people. So um, yeah. we divided up, um, as has been our tradition, the last three bishops have been around for him. We put together sort of a, a pilgrimage of the diocese, which includes celebrating mass in different locations and such. Well, I, I drew the short straw. I got the first trip. And uh, no, I'm kidding. I was privileged to take him <laughs> on his first trip. I'll be darned if he didn't get sick, really sick afterwards. And um, I, I was a little bit sick too. I mean, who knows if it was COVID back then? It was, you just it was don't the beginning know, right? of March. We don't know. Yeah. But he came out of it, um, like all of us, just you know, praying that we'd have a deeper understanding of God's love for us, a deeper mm -hmm. dependence on him. And it's been almost exactly one year since we took that first trip to one of our communities is Yankton, South Dakota, and um, still praying about it, right? Lord, what do you, what more do you want me to learn from this? And, and uh, I just know he desires, right? He desires mm -hmm. for us to know his love ever, ever deeper. 
Mm -hmm. and, and that continues to be our prayer. Yeah, without a doubt. It's, uh, it's been a journey for all of us. When you think about where we were last year at this time compared to the journey we've been on in the last year, you know, um, I've said this many times, I've been so impressed with our pastors, with our principals, yeah. you know, in Catholic yeah. school, with folks in your position who have had to really, and, and bishops, of course, who have mm -hmm. really had to adapt and, and make available spaces of worship, the Eucharist, you know, pastoral care, all those things in the midst of all this. And when there's so much fear and trepidation, you know, it just yeah. heightens the anxiety level. It's, it's a real challenge. Yeah. But Jim, you know, one of the many gifts, of course, uh, God brings good out of the most challenging times is, is what we're doing right now. You know, perhaps you were doing these podcasts before. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but they've certainly been enhanced this last year. And yeah. so I, I don't know if we would be talking today if it wasn't for COVID. So that's true. Uh, yeah, I'm that's grateful. True. Well, thank you. I'm I'm grateful that uh, that that we were able to connect. This is uh, this is a real treat. I we started advancing our church. Um, well, I did actually back in 2017 before I came to Changing Our World, um, and it was just uh, you know I was driving in the car a lot and I um, I was listening to podcasts and I just thought you know I, I I wasn't aware of a podcast for people who do our job, who work in Catholic organizations, who um, who do advancement, who do development, what have you and stewardship. And so um, I just decided to give it a shot and uh, changing our, I, I took a position with changing our world and they were excited to make this as part of our kind of staple of, uh, of services. And so through that, I've been able to meet all kinds of amazing people like you doing great things around the country. And it's been a real, a real blessing to me personally. And I, I'm, I'm glad I've, I've heard from a few folks that they've, they enjoy what we're doing. So we keep going. <laughs> so it's, it's Amen. great. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you've been with the Catholic Community Foundation there for over 26 years. That's got to be quite a ride. Uh, I saw over 400 million in assets. Foundation started back in 87, uh, according to your last annual report. Maybe you're higher than 400 million in assets now, but. Um, yeah, um, I would have to, to correct you. It's 140 million. 140, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's right. right. Um, Still significant for yes. the ICs with yes. uh, 33,000 oh, 34, households. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, what's the average length of a development director in any nonprofit these days, yeah. Jim? I think it's really like it's a year and a half or whatever yeah. it is. So, yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm, I, I consider myself a dinosaur to be 26 years of the same organization. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, this job, right? And mm -hmm. for sure, I, when I think about, I shouldn't be saying such confidence, but yeah, I do really feel strongly about it. For us to be good at this job, and also when I think of our call to be missionary disciples, mm -hmm. it is about relationship. Mm -hmm. And certainly our journey is relationship because it's relationship with Jesus. And, mm -hmm. and so um, it's hard to have really to develop the kind of meaningful relationships when you're in and out of organizations quickly. It's true. So the 26 years have really been a great blessing. Um, yeah. You know, they're, my life is so rich because of the friendships and relationships that mm -hmm. I've been able to develop over these years. And yes, many of them are donors. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are blessed with uh, significant resources. We've become close friends. They've invited me to their children's weddings and they've been invited to ours and nice we've gone to funerals of each other's and supported one another throughout life. And it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, I, boy, if anybody's out there listening, uh, my encouragement is if you can find a place where you can really sink, you know, your roots in and uh, develop those kinds of long term relationships and friendships. I, I just think it's rich and helpful. Yes. And it's a win, win, win for everybody, including the organization you work for. Without a doubt, you know, I've often thought that people in our in our role, um, we only get better the longer we're there for all the reasons that you just said, <laughs> because it does take time to, to build those relationships. And look at the service you provided in transitioning to a new bishop. I mean, that's you have a wealth of, of history with the diocese and with the foundation to, to draw on so he can hit the ground yeah. running as soon as he, as soon as he's ready. So that's tremendous. What is, uh, tell us a little bit about what was it like? You, you, you got the call 
and you took yeah. over. Where, where were you guys at 26 years ago? And, and how is it, you know, tell us about some of the growth. Sure. I'm sure you've seen a lot of change. Yeah. Thanks for asking, Jim. Um, the Catholic Community Foundation was called the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls Foundation. Yeah. It was established in 1987. And, and uh, Bishop Dudley and the lay leaders around him at the time really had enough amazing vision to think about this. And certainly a, a, a portion of it was uh, these are the beginning best practices out there and, you know, in the culture and the society at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way to uh, manage long-term assets and, and that mm -hmm. type of thing. And so a lot of... Um, those long-term assets of the diocese were then gifted to the Catholic Community Foundation and that board of directors took over, you know, control and, and such of it. But it really didn't have much of a, a growth side to it. And when Archbishop Carlson came, I think at the time there was one person who had four different job responsibilities and one of them was the foundation. Hmm. And so when he invited me here, it was because he felt that there was a, a enormous opportunity and responsibility really to grow mm -hmm. the foundation because we don't have any fortune 500 companies, at least not that yeah. I'm aware of. We still don't today. Um, a lot of our wealth is in the land. Yeah. Um, we're a highly agricultural background area and we have a lot of space. Now, over the years, we've, we've grown other industries, but the mm -hmm. foundation has really uh, become a, a great place, not only to, to steward and manage these long-term assets, but to really call donors into a spiritual understanding of the gifts that God has given them. You know, today's gospel reading, um, it, it's about the tenants, right? I mean, Jesus' parables, man, so many of the parables were about landowners and tenants yes, and such and today was that again and and it's what are we doing with those resources and gosh was it yesterday the day before me saint john paul ii had this really great oh it was yesterday uh lazarus right and the uh, mm -hmm. and this wealthy um person and you know wouldn't even give him the scraps off the table and yeah saint john paul ii in his homily it was one that he gave here in america said Jesus loves the wealthy and the poor equally, the dignity of every human person. The point he's making this parable is what are we doing with what we have? And, yeah. and so the Catholic Community Foundation became a great tool to invite people to understand the gifts they have as, as not owning them, uh, but really being a tenant, right, during the time that we're here on earth and how we use them. And uh, we, it's, a, it's a simple term. I'm sure many listeners have heard it, donor-directed giving. Mm -hmm. But it's it's still fairly new concept in the Catholic culture, and just mm -hmm. you know that you would actually, as a donor, be involved in your giving, like mm -hmm. prayerfully thinking about it, and being involved in as you as you understand discernment of spirits and discernment. You know what is God calling me to do with what I have? What are those things? Is it retreat ministry? Is it youth ministry in a particular way? Is it the support of our priests? Is it, you know, outreach to, you know, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of letting go in that. Um, mm -hmm. There's letting go from, um, for sure, pastors and bishops. And so our bishop really had to say, okay, people aren't just going to give me funds and, and I can kind of decide as I go. But to mm -hmm. articulate vision and think about that and uh, to invite people into that vision. And then even to adjust it, maybe respond as you get input. But once, of course, people are invested in a significant way, the giving is even richer. Uh, and I mean richer in terms of the experience. We use the acronym, uh, or not acronym, we use the, the saying, the joy of giving. Um, Pope Francis talks about the joy of the gospel. And, right. you know, I use the joy a lot. Uh, that's our litmus test. If a mm -hmm. donor has experiences great joy when they're done giving, we know, we, we believe we've done the ministry that we're called to do as opposed to a donor feeling a little buyer's remorse. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that or, <laughs> or giving out a guilt or obligation, but no, they're giving out of this beautiful understanding that all I am and have and ever will be is a gift from God and, and that God won't be outdone in generosity and to whom much is given much is expected. And, 
but to but to embrace that responsibility as opposed to oh my gosh i've got all this and i've got all this response it is a burden i mean in a sense it can be yeah. it can be an overwhelming burden or it can be a joyful thing god is calling me to and it's not like calling me to he's given me the grace to use it well he'll yeah. he'll let you know what it is to give to yeah. and at the end you can experience incredible joy yeah amazing joy so yeah. that's that's kind of those are the philosophies upon which um, yeah the Catholic Community Foundation has been built. And when I first came, we had 9 million in assets. Um, and so we have 140 million in assets now. Wow. But we also have 110 million in future estate expectancies that are actually documented. The mm-hmm. donors signed it. We know it. And they've actually determined through mm-hmm. endowments that aren't funded yet. They'll be funded through their estates, but they've determined what they want those things to go to. So you know, in a sense, you could say we're a $240 million foundation, but today's assets, it's $140 million. That's, that's an amazing testimony to, you, to your dedication, Mark. You know, listening to you talk, um, it's obvious to me and to anybody who's listening that you have a deep spirituality, that you're connected to the mission. Um, you know, what, what advice do you have for somebody who might be kind of new in your job and how do you keep that? Uh, did you, were you always where you are now or did it kind of build towards uh, that? In other words, I mean, um, wow, just hear, hearing you, <laughs> hearing you articulate it, you, you, you do it so beautifully. And I'm sure you share that with your staff. Like what's that yeah. journey been like? Oh, Jim, I'm, I'm a grateful recipient of so many wonderful people who have touched my life. Uh, and certainly obvious ones of bishops and priests and, Mm -hmm. holy men and women along the way. But honestly, I have learned the most probably from our donors themselves. Mm -hmm. When you engage and walk with your donors, um, I'm still, I I don't know. I just feel like I came out of the womb pretty selfish. Yeah. I kind (laughs) of let my mom know when I was hungry or needed to be, I don't know, whatever my need was. Right. (laughs) Uh, And to this day, I have to fight those tendencies. Um, I have, uh, I'm still a long ways from being generous, but I'm so much more generous than I was before because of my donors. Like, how can you not give when people are giving right. in these enormous, beautiful ways? And, and truly, I'm an example of you can't outdo God in generosity. The more Jeannie and I have given, and she's, she just is like totally, hey, uh, opposites attract. She is the most unselfish yeah. person. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the more we've given, we've just been blessed with more and more. Um, yeah, it's just remarkable. So that's my advice would be, be a donor yourself. I, yeah. and, and, and not just a donor, but be a grateful donor, be a generous donor. Um, and I'm not like, give till it hurts kind of guy. I'm like, right. give till you feel the greatest joy kind mm-hmm. of guy. And um, my advice is to pray and pray and pray. And so um I'm really blessed now. You know, my children are adult children, so it's easier. Nobody's at home. We have a monastery here now on the grounds of our Mm. cathedral. We were blessed to be a part of building that. Um, So our foundation, I'll have to tell you a little bit more about it. It's a unique model. I don't know that very many like it in the country, but um, uh, I go to mass in the morning whenever I can, because what greater way to start the day? I literally, you know, in the car, you guys don't, don't turn the radio on unless you listen to Jim's podcast. (laughs) <laughs> uh, advancing your church. I mean, there's really great things to listen to, but otherwise be in the silence Yeah, and say, Lord, what do you, who do you want me to talk to today? Mm. And give me the words to say Yeah, and connect me with those you want me to be connected with. Um, yeah. uh, I'm here, I'm open and desirous and mm-hmm. I'm a sinner, <laughs> but you can do great things, uh, you know, yeah. through, in my weakness. And um, let's, let's, let's have a great day together and, you know what somebody was sharing if you want to begin to really live this a spiritual life just this is mother Teresa's advice yeah start out in the morning the first thing you think of in the morning when you wake up you open your eyes in bed just say good morning jesus mm-hmm. <laughs> that might sound like oh come on but try it yeah good morning jesus mm-hmm. uh, it's it's just an awesome way to start your morning and i would say before you make a call to a prospective donor or, or existing donor, before you do whatever it is, just say a little prayer. Hey, Holy yeah. Spirit, give me the words 
it is just absolutely phenomenal uh, mm -hmm. what will happen. Yeah. That's my advice. Um, it's great advice. Yeah. That's, are you kidding? That's great advice. Um, I love what you said about your wife. I wouldn't be where I am absolutely spiritually or otherwise without her support and, and her love for sure. One of the one of the benefits of COVID and my working from home so much this past year has been we've gotten into doing morning prayer together. Oh, you know, wow. Before we, uh, before we start our day. And sometimes it's a rush because email and phone is already ringing off the hook by eight o'clock and other things are going on. But, you know, we just try to carve out that 10, 15 minutes and we do morning prayer. And it's been very special, I think, for both of us. And yesterday we missed it for what, you know, a couple things happened and we were just running around and, you know, like it, it's kind of formed the a spiritual foundation for us, I think, in, in some ways, just kind of stop. To, you know, thank God for the many, yep. many blessings he's given to us and, um, and pray for our intentions that day. So, so Jim, uh, can I uh, just, uh, this is yeah. personal, but I'll just share with you Yeah. one year after starting and we hit the blocks running Bishop Carlson was 49 years old, came from St. Paul, Minneapolis and uh, yeah. had all of these huge administrative tasks and, and really some heavy issues because the beginning of some of the clergy, abuse issues still just boiling up but for 13 years he was there as the auxiliary and then mm -hmm. was called here to, to Sioux Falls um it just had this heart of a pastor like all pastors right just wanting to be with the people and so we just went out and visited and met people and all that we had a great year he went on retreat and I I've saved the letter and I, I think about it because I it's uh, again, you know, our, our bishops, our priests, they're, they're human. Um, they're sinners like us, but they are gifted and they, they, they do have a vocation and a call they've responded to. And um, Bishop Carlson on his retreat wrote me a letter like, OK, come on, I see you often and you write me a letter. What's this about? And I get this letter. Yeah. And it just it was a personal letter. And I'll, I'll share it because uh, I've I'm now 62 and. I'm on the tail end. So this is advice for anybody else who's younger out there. And, and you're, what you do with your wife, the jam is the thing that inspired this thought. He mm -hmm. said, Mark, the first three paragraphs, man, puffed me up. I'm feeling great. Cause he said, what an amazing year we've had. And yeah. we've accomplished this. We've accomplished that. And we've done this and that. And, and really it was amazing. Even the financial results, right. He could list. And then came the last, the final, the fourth and final paragraph where it was like, bring this is the point to to bring me down to earth was um no matter how many great things we accomplish for the foundation and we will have failed if you have not first and foremost been true to your call from god as a husband and as a father wow i see all the time and sacrifice and energy and passion that you have for the catholic community foundation however <laughs> that is, we will have failed if you're not first and foremost understanding and paying attention to your priority as a husband and father. Yeah. So whether you're called to be a, a wife and mother or husband and father or a yeah. <clears throat> generous single person, whatever that is, uh, anybody listening, um, that's yeah. another big piece of advice. And so, Jim, I love how you and your wife have been called and, and, and expressed and articulated in the way of doing morning prayer together. So yeah. It's not only prayer, but you're doing it together in the context of that beautiful vocation of marriage. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I love that he was so sensitive to that. I working, um, I used to work for Bishop Barris. He's now in Long Island, but when I was in the Diocese of Allentown, he would often remind me of that. You know, I see you working a lot of hours. How's Kristen, my wife, you know, how are the kids, you know, just, uh, there, it, and that takes a certain sensitivity because it's always, you know, we were, as development directors, a lot of times we're on, we're about numbers, you know, we want to yeah. hit our goal and, you know, we're managing people, but that's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful letter that sounds like you wrote you and, and just uh, a, a great reminder to all of us just to take a, take a breath <laughs> and remember what's yeah. truly why, why we're in this, you know, and uh, just a final thing, a uh, practical, yeah. but I'm, uh, we have a beautiful retreat center here called broom tree. Yeah. And once a year I go on silent retreat. It's just nice. a three-day men's silent retreat, but I would encourage anybody listening. And I did that even when we were active and had children, and my wife would go on a silent retreat as well. Um, yeah. I highly encourage that. 
I, I, I do think even if you don't necessarily consider yourself, none of us probably do contemplative, right. but that just means, you know, having that component in your life where you do have some silence and you listen. Mm. And um, so that would be another practical thing to think about. Yeah. I've never, I've never been on a silent retreat. What, what is that like? Oh, it's amazing. So th- these uh, retreats and broom tree, one of the, the particular mm-hmm. um, focuses, if you will, is on Ignatian spirituality, St. Ignatius. Yeah. And, and so it's pretty common, I guess, in that uh, part of uh, anyways, that uh, spirituality in the church. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that makes a, a silent retreat so cool to me is that it's because you're in silence the experience on that weekend is so unique to you and where you're at, mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. that moment. Yeah. Um, there, there are, of course, a celebration of the Eucharist where you're praying and singing. Uh, so it's not like you're in silence during mass. There are conferences, they call them 20, yeah. 30 minutes throughout the day. And in Ignatian spirituality, they follow uh, beginning with, you know, basic points. God loves you and created because you're created by God. You are beautiful and perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. but we have fallen, we're human. And so we have fallen. And because of that, we have separated ourselves from God. He's never separated himself from us, but we have, uh, turned away from God. Um, but God has, uh, reconciled us to himself Mm -hmm. and the resurrection. Right. And so it follows this simple kind of basic thing, but it's good for us to be reminded of those things. And so Mm -hmm. the conference is, tell those stories if you will and there's usually some scripture to read and reflect on Mm -hmm. um but you're encouraged really not to read other things it's really to be in silence and you go for a walk or you do that you journal maybe i do a lot of journaling Mm -hmm. sit in the chapel wherever you feel um you best hear god's voice in the Mm -hmm. silence and um and then it so when you enter the silence and then at the end when you leave the silence um, it's, it's remarkable. I've gone now with my, my 90 year old dad went and he's now passed away he, at 90 years old. He was living in a lot of silence because my mom had died five years earlier, but he mm. still had this desire and he loved going on silent retreat. I was like, dad, come on. You know, our winters are long out here and yeah. he lived in Minnesota and he still wanted to go on silent retreat. Loved it. Um, and we'd be together, but we're not talking. And so um, that was powerful. My brother, my son, son-in-law, who's not Catholic, is gone. Mm-hmm. Highly encourage it because um, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no like, well, I don't know if I can do it right. or You don't mm-hmm. have to worry about any of that. It's yeah. God loves you right where you're at, and he'll speak to you right where you're at. Wow. That's awesome. And did you say you brought your son? Yeah, my my son has been on it, and yeah, uh, yeah he's from Denver, but he's you know that's yeah. just a priority we made, and he flew that's in, cool. and went on retreat, and what's really amazing, my son-in-law is not Catholic, and he oh, okay. uh, huh. married my daughter just a year and a half ago, so I guess he was trying to maybe make good points with his future father-in-law, and <laughs> engaged my hurt. daughter and went on retreat, <laughs> but then he came back after. In, in his first year of marriage. And now again, now that they have a child and um, yeah. so they're grown, but it's fun. Yeah. That's awesome. So you can have I, a son? So you have a son yeah, can I daughter? tell you one, one thing he said yeah. this time after three yeah. years, right? He said, yeah. Mark, this is afterwards. And now we're home and my wife's asking us some questions and yeah. we're visiting about the retreat. And he goes, you know, if Catholics truly believe it's the body, blood, soul, divinity of Christ, mm-hmm. how come they're not going to the mass all the time? I, I don't get it. If that's truly, wh- where is everybody? <laughs> what that's a great, great question. <laughs> what can I say to him? <laughs> Other than, yeah, uh, you know what? Um, yeah. We all have a lot to learn in that area, right? To we do. Because he so wants to go to, the, to receive the Eucharist. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, there are so many Catholics who, I, I guess, surveys have shown that there are so many Catholics that don't believe that it's truly the body and blood of Christ. So... How beautiful that he recognized that at this point in his journey, you know? And how embarrassing sort of, not embarrassing, but what a sort of gut check, uh, reality check for us yeah. as Catholics. And then, you know, I got to look at myself. When do I take it for granted? Often. Sure. And, and what am I doing to help my brother and sister Catholics who aren't uh, appreciating mm-hmm. um, 
receiving the sacraments. And of course, we're all facing that now as we come out of COVID, yep. Lord willing. Mm-hmm. Um, what can we do to invite people? Hey, come on, let's go to mass. Let's go receive that supernatural power. Yeah. Right. Let's go be Superman, Superwoman. Let's sure. go get it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Now you have a son and a daughter and you have how many grandkids? Yeah. Two daughters, uh, two daughters. a son. Yeah. The two, the two oldest live in Denver and then one lives in a kind of a yeah, 20 minutes here in a small town outside of Sioux Falls and uh, nice. two grandkids. Um, nice. Last year, uh, it was a hard year, you guys, but man, it was a beautiful year and blessed for us because we have our first two grandchildren and, and news wow. of our third on the way from our, ah. our son is I'm just praying for his wife mm-hmm. that uh, the baby and she can stay healthy. Yeah, they're that's in their second beautiful. trimester. Oh, that's great. God that's won't. Great. What did I say? God won't be outdone in generosity. <laughs> that's right. What a <sighs> proof. What, what a great phase you're in. That's exciting. That's yeah. awesome. How about you, Jim? Well, we have uh, we have three kids. Uh, we have two daughters and a son. Our, my oldest is a sophomore in college. She's going virtually right now to Temple University. So she's doing it upstairs here at home and um, hopes to be there in the fall in person. You know, things start to clear up. And then I have a junior and a senior in high school. My son's the youngest. And then my old, my middle child, my daughter is, uh, my wow. Madison is a senior. So, um wow. You know, it was interesting. Uh, they, they, um, it just worked out that they went to the the local public school. We wanted them, you know, Catholic school, but it just, the, the needs that they had were better served where we were at. Mm-hmm. And so um, they did Catholic school K to eight, and that was a great experience. But um, consequently, there's just not been a lot for them in religious formation going to public school. So one of the things, um, actually, my son and I tomorrow are going to do a virtual men's conference. Uh, oh, so. Great. I, uh, we were, he, he's been a good sport. He's 16. It's going to be hard to get a 16 year old up, you know, before nine o'clock on a Saturday, especially when he, <laughs> he, he likes to go ga- you know, he likes to play games, computer games with his yeah. buddies. And, and honestly, you know, in this environment, that's been one of his only social outlets to hang out with his buddies online and it's all safe and, you know, it's, it's been fine, but he's going to get up tomorrow morning. We're going to, I'm going to have breakfast. We're going to have a little breakfast for him, make him some waffles. And then he and I are going to come downstairs here to the basement and watch the men's conference. So I'm looking forward to it, you know, just oh, uh, that's awesome. trying to spend some time just talking about, you know, our faith and what's important and, you know, just, yeah. uh, he's there just growing up so fast. It's amazing. You know? Yeah. Good for so. you to find uh, that opportunity and connect with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, the, the great thing is he's just such a good sport about the whole thing, you know, and he's just, he's just been um, so open to it. And so I, I appreciate that. You know, I'm sure he's thinking, Oh, I'd rather be in bed and I'd rather, yeah. <laughs> but he's a, he's a, he's a good kid. Um, they're all great kids. You know, my wife and I, my wife, we were blessed. My wife was home with them for a good part of their childhood, most all their childhood really. Yeah. And um, so that Priceless. was a blessing for us. Priceless. Yeah. yeah. If you're able. Yeah. 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 Our kids sometimes raise us, don't they? Yeah, they do. <laughs> well, I, I told my, my Brianna, who's my oldest, I mean, she changed my life the day she was born. You know, you think, you like to think that you're unselfish, but that really gets tested when you have a child, doesn't yeah. it? You know, then yeah. it's not, suddenly it's not about me. Everything yeah. is about the baby. And, um, and that, yeah. you know, that was good for me at that point in my life, you know, and, um, and it's just been a growing experience throughout, throughout that journey. Yeah. So plus, uh, I loved my wife before we had children, but man, uh, because we were blessed to have children, and I, I know that's a real gift. Not everybody is. Mm-hmm. Wow, that love was exponentially yes uh, supercharged. Exactly uh, when we had exactly. children, I couldn't believe. I can't. And mothers are amazing. Yes, man, just amazing. Incredible. What a gift. Well, my wife, my wife taught me how to be a good dad for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and my parents, but my wife, I mean, just seeing her every day with the kids, just, you know, I don't, I don't know that dads are good. Dads are made, but we're really formed. You know, we learn along the way. I told my kids, you didn't come with an instruction manual. We're making this up as we go along. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's been a great, great journey. You mentioned um, going back to your, um, your ministry there, you mentioned you guys have a monastery. That's a, kind of a different model. Than you see in other parts. Of well, the, uh, the foundation is unique. Um, so the diocese of Sioux Falls has no development staff. Okay. I don't know if there's any other dioceses that have no development staff. Literally, there's none. You look mm-hmm. on the spreadsheet, there's not a right. No expense. 
Yeah. Like, and, and it's somewhat similar perhaps to state universities. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there are state universities that have no development staff, but what yeah. they have is that there's a robust uh, university foundation associated with the mother church, or in this case, the university mm -hmm. and their sole uh, mission of that university foundation is to advance the mission of the university they're associated with. And uh, because they're unique and independent, they're able to be a little bit more nimble, perhaps, you know, and they can pivot and do things uh, with, mm -hmm. because they're, but everything is to help advance that. So with the Catholic Community Foundation for Eastern South Dakota, we're a, a, a mix of a community foundation, like I said earlier, donor-directed giving. Yeah. We have advised funds like community foundations do and, you know, all those various things. Anything you'd hear about a secular community foundation, we do mm -hmm. those things. Yeah, we even act as trustee for people. So we go above and beyond. We're even like wow. a bank trust office or department mm -hmm. because that's how we pay for our staff. Um, we you still have to pay fees. They're more. I think we're a little more competitive. Cause we're, but um, we're doing everything in a Catholic context. So people with Catholic values, they really appreciate that. And we yeah. happen to have that expertise here. But the other thing. So community foundation. But we're also like a university foundation that we have a, a robust advancement team, uh, mm -hmm. gift planning officers. That's what we call them, which is, or it's like a major gift officer, I guess, uh, or like a donor advocate because they're really advocating for donors. Right. And, uh, this team, as we have grown in this beautiful teaching, of the church of subsidiarity, you know, the best ministry happens in the neighborhood and that's yeah. so we're going to establish parishes there. And, yeah. and the, that com local community is going to have a pastor and they're going to take care of one another. And, and the community around them. Well, likewise, uh, we're trying to, instead of being top heavy, because we, we have a big team, we have, there's uh, 18 of us, but rather than it being um, us coming down on, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, we have uh, six of those gift, major gift officers are living in local communities. So mm -hmm. they're really engaged. I mean, they, they're members of the local parish. They work, they see mm -hmm. the pastors all the time. They're helping the pastors advance the mission locally. Yeah. And, and helping the donors, connecting them to the larger as well as the local church. Um, and then we're the solidarity piece of it, where instead of duplicating and having all these different databases and all the different infrastructure and, mm -hmm. you know, mailings and all that kind of stuff you have to do administratively, let's use best practices. We have one big, robust database mm -hmm. and as these satellite offices all work together with it. So um, we think it's a little bit smarter. It's more efficient. Um, it focuses those staff on one thing and one thing only, which is relationships mm -hmm. uh, and um, being really tuned into the local church and people think locally and that's understandable parochially. It, it, sometimes mm -hmm. we use that word, but not only we think would they I mean, if a, and, and, and then we try to eliminate we, it's, it's about collaboration versus competition. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody listening has ever felt they've been in a little bit of competition. It's a strong word to use, but um, it happens right yeah. with other nonprofits, yeah. but it can happen sure. even within the Catholic community where, you know, this donor is a member of that church. They also uh, give to this homeless shelter and they give to the school and I better get to them before they do, because yeah. I want to get their money before they give it to others. And so yeah. we try to be, take a collaborative approach, which is Good. understanding all the different ministries and that one's better than another and really trusting again, the discernment of that donor and, um, and then, but also uh, understanding a particular way, because the diocese has no development staff, we know what the priorities are of the diocesan church and our bishop, and we can articulate mm -hmm. those. So um, when we talk to a donor, it's a much more comprehensive approach. Some of our larger ministries, like the school, has a development team, um, but we, again, work in collaboration we don't always do the call together, but we just want to understand one another. And it's not a race. Mm -hmm. This is not a competition. This yeah. is about helping the donor get to heaven. Right. And ourselves in the process. Yes. Like as a, as a husband, my pri priority, right. Is to help my wife get to heaven. Hers is to get me to heaven and our children for sure. It's yes. Same with our donors. It's about mm -hmm. helping each other grow in our holiness and our journey to holiness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can do it without, considering what we value in life. And one of the yes. best ways we articulate what we value is by how we spend our money, where we use our money 
and, and other resources. And that's where the community foundation walks and journeys with people who've been blessed with great wealth and the mm-hmm. good that can come from profit, not only in, in providing jobs that provide dignity to individuals, but also in the good that can happen in the community with the wealth that they have. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, I, I know there's many pastors and others who do ministry who wish, I wish we didn't have to raise money. I just wish we had the money. Sure. But you know what would be wrong with that model? It'd be easier for me. But the bummer is it wouldn't cause me to have this concerted effort of articulating our mission and vision and inviting people to be a part of it. And yeah. we'd be missing out as donors in growing in this richness, right, of the joy of giving. And and, and it's a great help in my journey to holiness. So um, when it comes to specific projects, so you mentioned the monastery, the, the diocese uh, wanted to build a monastery on the grounds of the cathedral. We have contemplative mm-hmm. order of sisters who pray um, semi-cloistered, uh, Eucharistic adoration and um and, and so in that process, the diocese hired us to raise the funds. They could have hired any other organization. They decided to hire us. The, the benefit here is the, the relationships stay uh, here locally. And, it's, and the fees on, and they, they, when they hire us, we have a responsibility. There's some fee and, and that they pay us as well to do it. So the restoration of our cathedral you talked about, we're mm-hmm. able to do that. Um, we're part of building the retreat center and also a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. So um, those are four capital projects in particular that we were blessed to be a part of. Um, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but uh, I don't know. I haven't run across any other diocese that doesn't have development. Not that I've done a big study Mm -hmm. either. I don't want to, I'm not saying sure. that's, uh, and that makes us special. I just want to say it's a unique dynamic Oh, and is. the diocese then hires us also to implement their annual appeal. I should say that. And there's a mm-hmm. few other Catholic community foundations in the, uh, in the country that do implement annual appeals for their diocese. Mm-hmm. And again, why should the diocese have a database for all the fundraising? We already have one. That would be a duplication and an, an additional right. expense. Mm-hmm. It certainly does make it cleaner and streamlines the whole thing when you're only dealing with one entity for Catholic philanthropy in the diocese. It makes a lot of sense. I, I have I have seen some others. Um, Philadelphia model comes to mind. They Is do. It? Okay. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, Sarah Hanley, who actually was on that panel uh, that we had a couple weeks ago with the nonprofit alliance, um, she was a part of the original development staff uh, for the diocese, Archdiocese of Philly uh, when they transitioned to this Catholic Community Foundation of Greater Philadelphia. Um, so they basically now outsource all their development. I believe Orlando has one. I think there's some others around the country. Oh, awesome. it, it's, not, um, it's not as common. You know, uh, there's a growing number of Catholic foundations around the country. I think last, the last report I saw was like 140. They're all different shapes and sizes and different missions. You know, some are just planned giving. Others like yours are a full service model. Um, so I think the bishops, I think the, the story of that is bishops are finding their own comfort level with it. And then in some cases, maybe like yours, it grows over time. Once there's a comfort level, maybe you expand the mission of that foundation to be more inclusive like you're doing. So. Yeah. And um, again, that prayer every day is it's not about me or the foundation. Right. Lord, what do you call us to? And so yeah. who's to say Bishop DeGrood might want to... Mm-hmm do a different model and we're here to serve. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah. And, and, and that's the subsidiarity of our church in North America, right? Every diocese right. is unique and different because, mm-hmm. um, locally that's their local and regional, right. And so it's going to look and feel different and it should, cause we're all unique and different. And, yeah. um, but Jim, through your work, you help us share best practices and, have ideas and think about things a little differently. And Mm. that's, I think, so helpful uh, Mm. for us when we do that and collaborate. Um, For sure, our our foundations, our dioceses should not be in competition. Right. I I can't imagine any reason why we wouldn't be sharing, hey, this worked for me and what works for you and and, um, and advancing. Yeah. Advancing our church is just a great model for it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, 
Mark, it's been great to spend some time with you today, you know, in the spirit of uh, this is the year of St. Joseph. You have the Cathedral of St. Joseph there in Sioux Fall. And, you know, I, I've, I've spent a little time this year kind of getting to know, it's interesting, St. Joseph is our spiritual father. You know, I, I don't know if you've spent any time on that. I'm actually doing a um, a 33-day consecration right now on St. Joseph where I'm just, there's a little reading each day and a little prayer and, um you know, I just, I see many of those attributes, honestly, and so many people that I work with, you know, and, and getting to know you a little bit today, I think you bring a lot of those gifts as well. I mean, St. Joseph was, he brought people together. He was a, he was a protector. He was a, a wonderful father to the, you know, to, to Jesus. And there's just so many of those aspects, I think that, um, that you will bring, you bring to the table clearly. And, and certainly I think many of the people that we work with around the country. So thanks for your ministry. Really do. Uh, thank you, Jim. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm humbled to be a part of it. Like, who am I that God would call me here to do this? Uh, but all right, he did. So, you yeah. know, let's go. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, can you imagine, Joseph? I just got to say, uh, man, if I woke up in the morning and said, yeah, I had this dream. Right. I, I don't know that I could act on that. Like, right. Do it yeah. all. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and if man. he hadn't said yes, where would that leave Mary? You know, I mean, just the story would have been so different. Um, yeah. And if it was about his ego, right? Tremendous amount of faith there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's what's been most rewarding, just that 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 faith that he had to follow yeah. God's plan in his life and um, and protect Mary and protect Jesus and, you know, and be that father to him. I mean, when you think of all the beautiful traits that Jesus had, certainly they came from above, but I'm sure he picked up a lot of those from Joseph, you know, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that's he right. did. Yeah. Know? Boys learn yeah. to be a man through their father. So it's a great story. Oh, partially anyway, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. It was great to have you on the podcast today. Thank, thanks so much, Jim. I hope it's a blessed Lent for you and all the listeners. God bless you. Thank you. I want to thank Mark for being on our show today and for sharing his faith and ministry with us. If you'd like more information about Mark or the Catholic Community Foundation of Eastern South Dakota, I'll leave links in the show notes. And of course, to view the full video presentation of this podcast, please visit the show's episode page on advancingourchurch.com. Well, that's our show this week. Many thanks to the Changing Our World podcast team and the Pottery Studios for another great show. If you'd like more information about our show, please visit us at AdvancingOurChurch.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, and we are a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for over 21 years. For more information, please visit us at ChangingOurWorld.com. Well, that's it for me, everyone. Enjoy the final days of Lent, and have a great week. God bless.